So we are going to look at the last great civilization of the ancient Mediterranean, uh, ancient Rome. We are going to be looking at two periods of Roman history and Roman art in this chapter. We're going to be looking at the Republican period and the Imperial period. Uh, the Republican period is, well, when Rome was a republic, although we will be starting um, uh, right before that, but we'll see that in a moment. And then um, in the next video, we'll be looking at the, at the imperial period, uh, when Rome was an empire. So let's get going. Um, the Rome uh, we will eventually see uh, will morph into sort of this massive empire. But when we first start our sort of journey here, um, Rome is part, uh, well, Rome is under Etruscan rule. So uh, Rome is located in Italy. Um, the Etruscans controlled a good part of it here. So uh, at the time, um, around the 6th century BCE, Roman, Rome is under Etruscan rule. But in 509 BCE, um, Rome deposes the last Etruscan king, a guy named Tarquinius Superbus, and they install a senate. Um, the Romans, as we will shall see, were um, modeled themselves and their rule and their culture and their lifestyles and their religion um, very heavily from the Greeks. And so uh, Roman republicanism um, was very similar to Greek democracy. Uh, in, many, in many ways, it's, it's a sort of version of democracy. A republican form of government is except it is ruled by an elected representative. Uh, in fact, the Roman sort of motto um, and the banner that the Roman army carried, although no, that, and not at this time, not, not cl this is something closer to around 80 BCE or so, is a uh, standard. A standard is a banner, as a flag that you see on the upper right. Uh, the very famous SPQR, or Senatus Populisque uh, Romanus, or the Senate and the Roman people. So, um, you know, the Senate was thought to represent um, individual or the Roman citizens, and this plays a this this sort of civic pride and this sort of belief in um, the integrity of the citizen is really important in uh, understanding Roman culture. Um, this, like the Greeks, is a ho uh, humanist culture, so the achievements of the individual here are very, very important. Rome, after it kicks out its king, over the next centuries will conquer uh, surrounding areas. So the Etruscans, they'll conquer uh, Gaul, which today is modern-day France. They'll conquer the Samnites uh, and uh, a Greek colonist um, throughout the Aegean world, and then also even their biggest enemy uh, at one point, Carthage, and they will dominate that area. But in the very beginning, um, Rome is a city. Before it's an empire, it's a city. It's a large city. It's a city located on seven hills. Uh, the um, founding myth we have already talked about is the story of Romulus and Remus, and Romulus kills his brother, Remus, after being raised by a she-wolf and becomes the uh, king of Rome. Um, jumping ahead from the sort of mythic origins of Rome, in 211 BCE, um, uh, and Roman ruler Marcellus conquers the Greek city of Syracuse. And what this does is this brings Greek art and culture into Rome in a big way. I mean, Rome was already influenced by Greek things, uh, but this sort of brings sort of a craze. The, the Greeks at this point, you know, classical Greek culture is already, um, you know, 250, 300 years old at its, at its origins. And there, there is, you know, because of Hellenism, um, which we talked about, because of the Hellenistic world, bringing culture, Greek culture, everywhere, all over the ancient Mediterranean, um, there's already uh, the influence. Um, but by conquering the Greeks, 
uh, this once great civilization which brought the world, you know, cl uh, cl classical Greek philosophy and mathematics and culture and um, architecture. Uh, the Greeks um, and are the Romans admire the Greeks, and they want to incorporate these styles into their own culture. In fact, the historian Livy commented on this craze for the works uh, of the Greeks. But there's Greek influence coming in, you know, from all sorts of corners. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the city of uh, Rome. Um, I have posted another video that gives you sort of a flyby, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here pointing out the major monuments. Uh, let's look at a Greek... I'm sorry, a Roman temple, my bad. <laughs> uh, this is called the Temple of Portunus. This is in Rome. It is a small temple, um, but it is an important temple because it represents a kind of typical Republican um, Roman temple. You will see that it is sort of splits the difference between Greek temples and Roman temples. If you look at it from the front, um, you can see it is very Greek in its design with its Greek uh, pediment, with the frieze, um, with uh, the ionic column. So with, since it's ionic, we don't have metopes or triglyphs. Um, and it kind of gives the illusion of being a peripteral um, temple with the columns all around it, with these sort of peristyles, with these surrounding colonnade. But if we look more closely, we realize that the sort of back two-thirds of the temple are, are covered with what we call an engaged column. So these columns are sort of set into the wall, meaning they're decorative. They're not really doing any work because you don't, you don't need them. You have a wall supporting the structure. But they're there as sort of a reference to ancient Greek architecture. But there's also in this temple a huge Etruscan influence. It is set up on sort of a large pedestal, uh, like the Etruscans were. It only has a staircase in the front, like the Etruscan um, temples did, and it has a porch, like Etruscan uh, Etruscan temples did. Um, but the materials aren't uh, Etruscan. This is uh, stone. So it's here much more like a Greek a Greek temple. Um, so, you know, the Romans were, uh, especially as they became a larger empire and incorporated many cultures, the, the Romans weren't above sort of taking what works from the people who lived uh, within the empire or the civilizations that they conquered. So uh, this is, you know, very part and parcel with most Roman art and architecture that we will be seeing, it sort of kind of mixes and matches and takes sort of the best of what the Romans liked and then add it into something that suited their uh, their purposes. And so that that's what we're seeing in this little temple, um, the temple of uh, Portunus, uh, the god, this god of harbors. This is a much larger complex. Uh, this is a sanctuary for a goddess named uh, Fortuna Primigenia. Uh, she was an old goddess, an old Roman goddess. The, the Roman religion was um, heavily influenced by the Greek religions, and the, the main pantheon of uh, uh, the Greeks form the main pantheon, that's the group of gods, uh, of the Romans. But the Romans had lots of other gods. Uh, the Roman had ancient gods that were um, sort of more, uh, you know, native to, to um, you know, sort of a pre-Greek belief that the Romans that the Romans practiced. The Romans also uh, worshipped their ancestors um, as, as uh, if not gods, as sort of like helpful um, beings. Uh, and then they also had what were called household gods, sort of local gods that were local to homes or um, uh, cities or even families. Uh, so while the overall sort of view correlates to Greeks, 
uh, and the myths that the Romans sort of believed in as part of their larger religious uh, beliefs and practices were very heavily derived from the Greeks. Uh, there's also a, a, a sort of more domestic um, native influence of this other kind of pantheon of Greek gods, and the Fort Fortuna Primigenia is, is part of that. Um, this is in a place called Palestrina, uh, Italy, and state dates back to the second century BCE. Um, the exact date is controversial. Where there, there's a debate about exactly how old this is, a little older, a little younger. But for our purposes, it doesn't, it doesn't truly matter. This thing forms a, 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 this sanctuary is part of a huge complex that encompasses a shrine to the goddess. It encompasses um, a theater. It encompasses a, a large area for worship. But it also encompasses shops and, and stores. So um, this is a, a, an incredible architectural achievement. Uh, it is cut into a hillside. Um, the hill was turned into, uh, cut into a series of terraces, uh, allowing um, a series of ramps and stairways to sort of crisscross the terraces. And then in those, uh, against those ramps then, um, or, or sort of leading the ramps were leading up to then series of shops or buildings and then leading eventually upwards till to the shrine itself um, the Romans often designed their buildings in a way where uh, the passage through the building was very controlled Roman architects wanted you to sort of go certain ways. Now you might get an option of like, you know, you enter from the left or the right, um, but they would always sort of direct you to where you eventually needed to go. And this is uh, very much part of uh, Roman architecture. So you can see these ramps here while you can sort of enter right or left. Um, you're eventually going to sort of end up in the same place. Your only real choice is, well, kind of uh, if you want to take the left side or the right side. And then this leads upward into this central, this grand plaza. Uh, then which uh, there's a small theater that overlooks this grand plaza. And then at the very top is the temple itself uh, or the shrine itself to uh, the goddess Fortuna Primigenia. The, this, it's actually a rather small shrine <laughs> um, that probably contained a statue of the goddess, but it is the complex itself that is supposed to sort of inst instill sort of awe and wonder and not this rather small, in, in, in some ways, uh, I hate to use the word disappointing, uh, but uh, rather tiny <laughs> temple at the, at the top. The walls of this temple were made with a material called opus incertum, um, or uh, sort of inserted work. This, uh, the Romans used concrete uh, in, their, in a lot of their buildings. Um, concrete is a material made of sort of sand and lime um, and cement and um, water. And concrete is an extremely strong material, and it allowed the, Rome, the Romans to build on a scale that other cultures could not, that the Greeks couldn't, that the Egyptians couldn't, um, because concrete has some really great things going for it. Uh, concrete is light. Uh, it is um, more, uh, it is less expensive also than things like marble. Um, and since it can be sort of mixed on site, uh, it is easier to use because you don't have to bring, you know, haul in these large, massive stones, but instead you can bring in the material separately and then mix them together on the construction site. Um, but concrete was revolutionary, and it is what made Roman architecture um, so much more advanced in many ways than the architecture of its neighbors. But before we can really understand the significance of Roman, the Roman use of concrete, let's let's go back a second. Let's take a look at a, um, a an early architectural form that we have seen. Well, 
you know, all the way back with to, uh, to the Neolithic period. This is called the post and lentil system. And it's a system that's still, in, you know, used today. It's a, it's a great and efficient form, uh, especially if you use strong materials like steel, that which we use today. Um, but in the ancient world, the post and lentil, uh, besides wood, um, the most common material was you that was used would have been various types of stones. Think about the think about the Greek temples, which would have been made with marble, for example. And the problem with a post and lintel structure is that your weakest point is going to be right here in the middle, and you can only add so much weight at the top of the post and lintel before the center of the lintel will eventually give in and it will break. So the Romans used the arch. So the post and lintel is, um, you know, very weak. But with the arch, you can create much heavier and taller buildings because of the way this arch handles the weight that's coming from above. The post and lintel, too much weight and this will bust. But with an arch, um, the shape of it allows for the weight coming down to sublimate, to be distributed along this arch, and um, it can hold a lot more weight. Now, how does this work? Well, so the arch um, is based on se uh, a series of connected stones cut in the shape of a trapezoid. This is called a voussoir. But the center stone is a special kind of voussoir called a keystone. It's not always raised higher like this than the other um, voussoirs, but sometimes it is. In this example, it is. But what happens is weight comes from above. It presses against this keystone. But the, key, the way these blocks are cut, the keystone pushes this energy outwards. So we're going to see the Romans uh, build buildings on a scale that nobody really ever had before. Uh, because if you combine this, um, this arch with concrete, um, you're, you're creating very, very strong superstructures because the arch is able to hold, hold more weight and the concrete is lighter than traditional stone masonry or brick masonry and what you end up is a very, with a very strong structure. So let's look at some basic Roman concrete forms. The image on the left is a structure called a barrel vault and this is the most simple of the Roman architectural structures. Uh, basically a barrel vault is just an elongated arch, uh, but it works uh, based on, it, it's based on the same properties as an arch. And we will see uh, barrel vaults over and over and over and over again. Another um, basic Roman uh, uh, element is the what's called the groin vault. A groin is a connection. It is where uh, you know, different planes intersect. That's why the part of your body where your legs and your torso meet is called the groin. And so it is where two, or actually even more, uh, later on this semester we'll look at in the Middle Ages, uh, groin vaults that are made, maybe made up of, you know, you know, three or maybe sometimes even four intersecting barrel vaults. Um, but these connection points where the um, where the barrel vaults meet are much, much stronger uh, because of uh, basically these triangular shapes that are formed by the groins intersect and help uh, support each other. Also, it allows for mo more complex architectural design and layout with interconnecting hallways. Uh, here on, at the bottom left, we see what is called a fenestrated sequence of groin vaults. Uh, fenestrated means it just has windows. That's what fenestrated means. And so um, to allow in light in a way that is uh, very similar to the clerestory windows that we saw in ancient Egypt, uh, the Romans would use this fenestrated uh, groin vault, which functions very similar to, like I said, to clerestory window. And then on the right, we see a dome. And we're going to look at one building in particular um, in the next lecture uh, that uses that uses this technique. Uh, a dome, if you think about it, is just an arch that is spun around 360 degrees. So 
these are all basically these are all based on the same principle. Um, this sort of equal and outward uh, distribution of of weight, and it's going to allow the Romans to achieve literally great heights in architecture. So let's look briefly at at some Roman sculpture. Uh, Roman sculpture, in a lot of ways, draws heavily from Greek sculpture, Greek classical sculpture, um, and later through the Hellenistic. Um, you can see that in the depiction of the human body, in the in the realism of the form. Here in this figure of what we call a a, a Roman uh, patrician, uh, uh, the father, uh, if you will, of the household, uh, he is standing in kind of a modified contraposto position. Um, wearing uh, a, a Roman toga, but you can see the influence of that Greek um, wet drapery style that we have uh, talked about before. And there's a huge Greek influence. But there are also some significant differences between Roman and Greek sculpture. Um, Roman sculpture is much more realistic. In fact, we use the term verism. Um, verism means truthfulness. <laughs> the Romans wanted to capture the individual, um, and not an idealized individual, but a realistic individual. Uh, the Romans loved portraits. The Romans, um, part of a big part of Roman culture was ancestor worship, and um, it was important to portray those ancestors as realistically as possible. In fact, what we're seeing here is a statue of a man holding some statues. Um, there were Roman celebrations of their ancestors, and they would have these, uh, often made of wax or wood. Um, if you're wealthier, then you would have a, a marble sculpture of your ancestors, and you would parade them around as, as sort of a sign of, of your, um, your pride in your family, and so that is exactly what has happened here, this sort of patrician pride. But family, the family unit in Rome was, was very, very important, uh, not just because it was the way of propagating uh, other Romans and making more baby Romans, um, and you know, not, only, uh, not only that, but also because it, it formed this sort of center of, of business life. Roman families were... Um, were, or Roman businesses were family businesses with the patrician or the head of the household, sort of the CEO. Um, and so these Roman families, um, you know, marriages were, were business mergers, um, for instance, but it was, it was very important to sort of establish your family lineage as not just sort of out of respect for your ancestors, although that's part of it, but also as a way of sort of es establishing your integrity as a businessman and showing the strength and longevity of your family business. Um, one of the things you will notice, though, is this Roman verism, and the verism could be quite realistic. The Romans weren't afraid to show old people as old people. They weren't afraid to show sickness or disease or weird blemishes on people's faces, uh, receding hairlines. All of this incredible truthfulness um, was there for everybody to see. But the truthfulness stopped at the neck. <laughs> because look at this image here on the left of a Roman general. Um, we see this middle-aged or older middle-aged man's face sitting on this young athletic body, this sort of Greek-style uh, body. This would not be out of place, you know, next to the Doriferous, for instance. Um, and we've talked about the Greek or the Greek influence on Roman art before when we looked at the Greeks, because so much of the sculpture that we have um, was uh, uh, of the ancient Greeks were Roman copies. And remember, the Romans preferred marble. Um, Greeks, um, in in many cases, preferred bronze. But the Romans, when they copied the Greeks or made their own original sculptures, typically did uh, used marble. The Romans would paint their, their sculptures, not always, um, but they, they could be painted uh, absolutely just like in the Greek style, but not always. Um, this 
desire to sort of pay tribute to the past uh, can also be seen in Roman coinage. Now, up until um, Caesar, Julius Caesar, uh, Roman coins tended to have pictures of gods. But um, with, uh, after, after the sort of rise of Caesar and after his death, where he was viewed as a god, um, Roman emperors started putting their head uh, on, on coins. Um, this was sort of a little strange at first to the Romans, but then became common practice. But even in this Roman coinage, we can see that verism. Um, Caesar is shown as an older man here. We are seeing wrinkles. We are seeing um, uh, a sort of a, a verism, a, a veracity uh, to, to this portrait. Um, and so we can see that kind of, that realism through portraits of the emperors, as we see in this head of Pompey the Great, um, who, a Roman emperor who models himself after Alexander the Great. Um, we can see that sort of realism. Uh, the Romans weren't necessarily afraid to show, say, for example, a double chin <laughs> uh, uh, when it came to the depiction of their leaders. Romans kept slaves. Uh, there were two million slaves in Rome by the end of the Republican period. Um, most, most slaves never saw freedom, although uh, many were, um, many could be freed, um, and many freed slaves and would go on later to own their own slaves. Slaves often came from foreign peoples that Romans captured. Um, the slaves typically took on the names of their um, of their masters. And so this is a rather interesting funerary portrait of um, a, a, a Roman patrician, uh, Roman father, Roman patrician named Publius Gessius. And then we see on the left and right his two former slaves, Gessius Primus and Gessius Fausta. But even um, though they had been freed, we, they are still paying tribute to their former master and they have retained his name. Here we can see once again that Roman verism, um, the truthfulness to the to the age of the older man's face, uh, and then uh, a realism in the younger man's faces. But um, slaves could not own portraits of ancestors, um, but they did often make uh, uh, image. They they often had images made after being freed, but uh, as they were slaves. Uh, this is a, uh, a um, frieze depicting a funerary procession uh, of a slave. Um, you know, once again, you can see that sort of uh, realism in the movement of the people uh, throughout. Pompeii. Pompeii is a city 70 miles or so near Rome. And on August 24th, 79 CE, um, a volcano named Mount Vesuvius erupts, uh, covering the city of Pompeii and another neighboring, neighboring city called Herculaneum in volcanic ash. Um, while this was devastating for Pompeii, it was de de devastating for Rome itself uh, because they had to deal with this sort of huge crisis. Uh, it was great for historians because... Pompeii and, uh, uh, is trapped in sort of amber. Herculaneum was built upon, so it's not as well preserved, although we do, will see some things from Herculaneum. But Pompeii is um, like, it's like, it reminds me of the mosquito trapped in amber in Jurassic Park. It, it's been preserved. It's this city frozen in time, uh, sort of at the transitional period between the Roman Republic and the Roman Imperial period. And it gives us an amazing view that otherwise we would not be able to see of of Rome uh, at its at at sort of the height of the Republican period, because the problem with cities and the problem with well, he, he, 
human progress in general is that it erases the past or it builds on the past or it alters the past. And so it's rare to find any buildings or structures or cities or any artworks at all that have not been altered over time. And so Pompeii uh, is frozen in time. But the bodies of even the bodies of the people, thousands and thousands of people, were preserved uh, as this huge sort of wall of ash fell upon the city. So we have people, we have animals, we have livestock all frozen in time. This is the center of Pompeii. This is the center of the town. Um, like most Roman cities, uh, the, the center part of the town was called the Forum, which is where uh, the Roman uh, government buildings were, the local government buildings were. In Rome itself, this is where the Senate would be located. Um, there was also usually a temple. Uh, here we have the Temple of Jupiter, the main god in the Roman pantheon. And then we have a basilica. Basilica were generally like courts, buildings, and... Um, kind of function as sort of a uh, the sort of cent central civic uh, building of the town. And so this, everything else was kind of built around these uh, structures. So once again, here's this idea of sort of the, the Roman people uh, and the Roman government kind of being intertwined and taking center stage literally here at the center of town. Uh, you can see by this overview that the city of Pompeii is remarkably preserved in terms of the, the, the layout of the original streets and buildings and uh, the structures are uh, fairly well intact. Um, one of the um, most important buildings in Pompeii is the amphitheater. Amphitheater literally means double theater. The amphitheater of Pompeii is where uh, the citizens of the city would go to see sporting events, to see gladiatorial uh, battles, and this is something that we talked about with the ancient Etruscans, and certainly the Romans also had a very similar taste for to see these gladiatorial battles and these blood sports. Um, the Roman amphitheater is, uh, draws heavily from its Greek antecedent, it's a Greek counterpart, the theater, but amphi means double. So it is, you remember the Greek theaters were built in hillsides. Um, Roman theaters were freestanding, amphitheaters were freestanding, um, and what allowed this to happen was concrete, uh, because concrete could support the seats or the cavea, um, and the, the heaviness of these structures in a way that uh, Greek architectural technology could not, so concrete could help support this. Although this, uh, this particular structure was built by basically creating a dirt bowl and then filling the bowl with seats. Um, and then like the Greek uh, theater, uh, the seats were divided into these triangular uh, 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 sections um, called a cuneus. Uh, the exits and the entrances to the um, amphitheater uh, is called a vomitorium, uh, literally mean, <laughs> meaning that it would sort of spit out <laughs> people. Um, so you will never forget that vocabulary word. Um, so let's take a look at the outside, though, of this large theater of, that held 20,000 people and take a look at the concrete wall. In the front is a, an arcade. Um, and it appears on initial uh, inspection that this arcade went around the entirety of the building allowing sort of in multiple entrances, but this is what we call a blind arcade. The arches, um, so first of all an arcade is a row of arches. A blind arcade is a row of arches that lead nowhere. Um, but also Pompeii has a really distinctive feature that no other amphitheaters do, and that is this double staircase. Um, that leads into the structure itself. Um, this is not repeated in any other uh, amphitheater, but this is one of the most important um, structures in the town and an incredibly well-preserved amphitheater. Um, we have 
a uh, depiction from one of the houses, one of the wall paintings in one of the houses of Pompeii of the theater. And here you can see that distinctive double staircase. You can see the arcade. Uh, and then you can see, um, you know, the, the cavea, uh, the seats where we have gladiatorial combats. Um, this is depicting a brawl that happened uh, between Pompeii and um, um, uh, the people called the Nucerians. Uh, and this was a, a evidently rather sort of bloody and um, striking event, uh, enough so that it was uh, captured here. Let's look at some uh, homes of um, Pompeii residents. This is a kind of typical um, Roman home. You know, the great thing about Pompeii is that it has preserved... Um, these homes in a way that uh, didn't exist in Rome. And, and Rome necessarily didn't have these kinds of houses. Rome was more of a city of um, apartments, of what were called insulae. Um, but in these smaller towns like Pompeii, you could actually have these, uh, what was known as a domus, these Roman houses. But um, as I said before, uh, families were businesses are often related to businesses. And so these structures were not only uh, places to live, but they were places to conduct business. And in fact, some of these Roman um, houses actually had uh, little rooms at the front uh, that opened up onto the street. And either the family would rent them out to smaller businesses or um, they would have their own businesses in there. Um, okay, so this is the, a basic Roman um, house. Uh, at the front, we have what is called the focus or the throat. Um, we call it the foyer today, um, and this is the entryway into the home. And then you would walk straight into uh, an atrium. In front of you would be uh, what is called an impluvium, a water basin. So this is... Uh, um, where water would fall, there is an opening in the ceiling, and then you would use this water for cooking and cleaning and whatever other sort of domestic purposes. Surrounding that are uh, cubiculum. Uh, these are the bedrooms. Uh, they tended to be very, very small. The only thing you're really doing here is sleeping, and in many occurrences, there's not even windows in these things. Um, off to the side is the ala, or the wings. Um, this is where the uh, sh family shrines, uh, shrines to the ancestors and household gods, and uh, would be placed. And then we have the uh, tablinum, which is um, uh, generally the office. This is also where family documents and histories would be stored, um, but it also kind of served as a passageway, a throughway. Uh, through into the garden area behind. And then there is the triclinium or the dining room. And then um, some homes had a much larger courtyard garden area in the back um, called a peristyle, um, you know, a, basically a, a colonnade um, encircling a central area. We are familiar with that term from ancient Greek. Sculpture, but not all of uh, not all of the homes are going to have this sort of large area in the back. Many of them are going to kind of stop here and just have a smaller garden attached at the end. Um, this is the interior of um, the focus, the the foyer as you would walk into um, the home. Uh, here we can see the impluvium basin at the bottom with the opening in the ceiling allowing for rainwater. Uh, we know a lot about these homes because of a Roman writer named Vitruvius. Vitruvius is a name we're going to see again uh, when we get into Rome itself and look at some of the buildings of the imperial period. Uh, he's also a name that is uh, going to crop up through the rest of the history of art, uh, as we'll see when we, uh, if you take the second part of this course and um, we explore the, the Renaissance. So you'll, you'll see his name. Um, he was an architectural theorist. He had sort of these ideas of what were the most sort of efficient kinds of homes, buildings, temples, 
um, whatever. And uh, a lot of his focus was on sort of the efficiency of design, and a lot of his ideas have survived uh, to this day. This is the peristyle. This is from the House of the Veti. Although this is actually not a typical domus, this is a much more extravagant home than your sort of typical uh, Roman home. But it's um, but this this peristyle would be the same, and no matter kind of what sort of home you were looking in, we can see the colonnade, and then we can see. Um, you know, a garden, and, and the Romans would have, you know, this year they could have grown herbs, they could have grown vegetables to eat, and then just decorative flowers and the like, much like, you know, we grow our own gardens today. So the Romans uh, decorated the interior of their houses, uh, often by um, painting the walls uh, using um, fresco techniques, um, often painting stucco sometimes so the surface could be raised uh, from the wall or sometimes just painting the stone itself. Um, there are four main phases of Roman wall painting and so we're going to explore all four of them. The first style which we call the masonry style is also the simplest. This was borrowed from Greek decorative style but as we can see in this home from Herculan Herculaneum um, the, this is kind of the, I call this the faux finish style because we can see that um, the artist has tried to imitate different kinds of marble, wood, different kinds of stone. Um, this wasn't really fooling anybody. Everybody knew that, you know, you're looking at a painted wall, but the idea was to try to create a much richer uh, appearing home. Um, and so, so this style sort of dominated the late 2nd century BCE and is the oldest of the Roman decorative wall styles. Our next style is illusionistic style, or the second style. And uh, these wall paintings tend to um, be images of people or scenes, landscapes, architecture, and there's a real desire by the artist to make these these scenes appear as if they are additions, very often additions to the room itself. So there will be, here we see like these Corinthian columns that are painted, um, but are made to sort of fool the eye, trompe l'oeil style we say, um, to f make us look like we're, uh, feel like we're looking through an architectural feature into a landscape beyond. This whole, this is a, um, uh, a pom a murals from um, Pompeii that had been brought to, um, uh, I'm sorry, not from Pompeii, but Bos Boscarial, uh, that had been brought to the Met Museum in Rome. And let's take a look at one of the panels in particular. Um, this is called a tholos. This is a circular shrine that was common uh, in ancient Rome. But look what the... Uh, the painter has done here. Uh, they've gone to sort of great lengths to make this look as, as realistic as they as they possibly could. Uh, we see these rather uh, you know sort of lifelike fluted columns with our Corinthian uh, capitals sitting on top. Notice this pediment, but this is what we call a broken pediment because the cornice doesn't extend the entire way. And then if you look in the background you can see um, a, a forum, a sort of courtyard in the in the distance with um, two colonnades. Now there is a, an attempt here to create a realistic three-dimensional space. This is a very early version of something we call linear one-point perspective. This is a technique that was perfected during the Renaissance. But uh, if you look in, at, at this drawing here on the left, uh, the, the basic idea behind one point perspective is that um, you have a horizon line and a vanishing point and all of the objects as they recede in the distance appear to meet at that vanishing point and this is this is something you've seen if you've driven a long straight stretch of highway before and everything the highway itself seems to meet itself it, the, the sides seem to meet in the distance even though you know that the sides actually remain parallel with each other the entire way. And so this is an early version of that. It's not as mathematically precise as later attempts at 
Uh, one point perspective would be, you know, 1500 years later in the Renaissance, but it is, it is an, a remarkable uh, attempt at spatial realism that had never really been attempted before in the ancient world. And there's other examples of this uh, throughout the second style. Um, this is a rather complex and fascinating image, uh, second style image, uh, representing um, a, a mystery religion. Mystery religions were these sort of cult religions in, in ancient Rome that revolved around an, uh, secret initiation rites. And um, we are not going to spend a lot of time on this image. Um, but this is called the Dionysian Mystery Freeze. This was a cult centered on the Greek and Roman god Dionysus, the god of wine. But you're looking at a, um, a sort of initiation ritual uh, that involved um, sort of a flogging of the initiate. But in truth, the, the, the full story is, is, is hard to decipher because this was a mystery religion and these rites were generally kept secret. Um, you know, one of the things with Roman uh, painting, or the painting of Pompeii, I should say, is that it's not often of the same quality as some of the paintings we do have surviving for, from Rome because the really great artist would have been working there in that large city center. Uh, the paintings that we have sort of out here in the sticks, if you will, out in sort of these smaller towns, aren't always the same quality. And you can kind of see that here uh, in the proportions of uh, the, the figure here and sort of the weird lack of detail in, in her body here. Um, the, the sort of level of command of, of realism that the artist had of the human figure uh, out here with a maybe a lesser artist isn't quite as strong as it would be uh, in Rome. But what makes Pompeii so fantastic is that um, we have these paintings so well preserved. Okay, um, so this is from um, a, a, a building we call the Villa of the Mysteries. A villa is not a domus, it's not an urban home, but it's typically a large, sprawling country home um, that was uh, the domain of the very wealthy and powerful. This comes from the Villa of Livia. So this is um, the wife of the Emperor Augustus. This is from her um, home at Prima Porta. So this is uh, where that uh, uh, where a statue we'll be looking at in a little bit, the Augustus of Prima Porta, or actually in the next um, video, um, is also located. And here we have a remarkable um, image. There's nothing really quite like this that we have, else like this that we have from ancient Rome in terms of sort of its um, expansiveness and its minute detail of nature. Um, once again, we have these illusionistic elements. We have this wall, um, so this sort of trompe l'oeil element, meaning to um, make you uh, think that you can walk out through this wall, through this little gate here, and uh, go into this surrounding kind of garden. In the distance, we see all sorts of different flora and fauna, birds and trees and flowers and fruits. Um, but also what is remarkable about this is we are looking at another kind of perspective. This is called atmospheric perspective. But you'll notice that in the distance how the um, the plants appear to get hazier and less in focus, just the way real things do in life because of the distortion of the air of the atmosphere. The distortion of the light makes things that are further away appear less in focus. So that has been replicated here. And there's really not a lot of other instances of this in the ancient world. So the, the Romans are kind of building on what the Greeks have done. They're building on what other cultures before them have done. And they're, they're pushing um, their love of realism, sort of pushing the boundaries of what artists had before here been capable of. Um, but this is, you know, so if the, the Dionysian mural that we saw 
is um, you know made by maybe a second rate artist. This is because this is the home of the Empress. This would be the very best artist that Rome could have provided uh, creating creating these images. So the first style is what the first style is this sort of faux finish style. The second style is um, this illusionistic style. But the third style is kind of an oddball. The third style um, gets away with illusionism for the most part and is more concerned with sort of emphasizing the flatness of the wall. It's emphasizing the, the sort of wallness of the wall. Uh, it tends to be decorative. It tends to be mostly abstract designs. Although, as you can see, there are small... Um, sort of uh, little landscape pictures or pictures of animals that can be uh, inserted in here as sort of a decor decorative element. But these aren't illusionistic in the sense that uh, you don't feel like you could step out uh, into this into this little building that is being portrayed here. It's really quite tiny if you look at it in context. Um, if you also look uh, at the decorative ele elements, you can see that, yes, these are architectural elements. These are columns. This is a kind of a pediment. But these are completely unrealistic. No column could actually ever be this thin and expect to support any sort of architecture. On top of that, th there is no sort of desire by the artist to make it appear as if you are looking at a real architectural element. Uh, occupying the space that you are in and that you could sort of just walk through this. You'll also see that um, the areas have been divided into these larger colorful zones, um, these sort of decorative uh, areas of bold color. And so this is the third style. It's this very decorative style, emphasizes the flatness, the artificiality really, sort of the wall of the picture plane, and um, uses a lot of decorative elements. The fourth style, I sometimes call it the kitchen sink style, but that is by no means an official <laughs> title. But it, it combines sort of little bits and pieces of the three previous styles, but to form a very distinctive style in its own. Uh, this came from the uh, Domo Sorea, or the golden house of the um, mad emperor Nero. And so this is a very extravagant example of the four style. So we can see those sort of that sort of faux finish of the first style. Um, there is an illusionism here of the second style, but it's it's sort of underplayed. Um, instead of trying to show you like a door or a window or a gate that you can just kind of walk through. Um, what we get is more like a, a picture on the wall. So this is more similar to uh, maybe the third style where you'd have like a tiny picture. But these do tend to be larger in the fourth style than they do in the third style. Uh, we also see those just kind of decorative borders and elements here. Um, one sort of nod to the second style, we do have some columns that are um, uh, more realistically proportioned. Uh, and do offer sort of a little false window out into the world, but nothing on the scale, nothing on the scale as, as your typical second style. You would never sort of even be remotely fooled that this is nothing more than a painting on the wall. Um, so really the four style in a lot of ways is, is um, kind of a hodgepodge of what came before. All of these different styles sort of brought together. Um, very typically, but not always, um, you'll see the walls painted white um, or sometimes some other solid color to make all these other decorative elements kind of stand out. Um, but what the fourth style does, though, um, it sort of functions in the s same way that uh, we hang pictures on our walls today because many of these smaller illusionistic images function in the same way that a frame painting in our homes would today. So let's look at some of these. Um, here's one um, 
a four stall wall painting called from a room called the Ixion Room uh, in Pompeii, in a home in Pompeii. Um, you can see. Uh, you know, this is even more kind of a kitchen sink approach. Um, sort of pictures are sort of placed willy-nilly. Uh, realistic architectural elements are placed next to sort of faux finish style, which are placed uh, next to uh, kind of faux statues um, over and over and over again, forming this almost kind of quilted <laughs> effect, I think. Uh, but if we look at this image here, um, we see, although this is a, a painting that is part of this much larger decoration, we can view it as a sort of singular work of art in itself. And we see this mythological story of this, of this guy named Ixion who fell in love with Zeus's wife Hera, and Zeus, who is jealous, punishes him by binding him to a spinning wheel. And you can see that partially over here. I think that's rather hypocritical of Zeus, don't you, though, after all of the... Uh, affairs he had and all the heroes he bored, uh, born out of wedlock. Um, I, I think he should take a, a, a chill, but that's just my own personal opinion. Here is an example of a mosaic, um, a fourth style mosaic. And remember, mosaics are made up of tiny little tiles. Um, this uh, this comes from a house in Herculaneum, uh, and this is an image of, of the god Poseidon, or Neptune, I should say, uh, and his wife. But we can see um, that fourth style. We have illusionistic columns, but they're holding up sort of a decorative pattern that looks like no building whatsoever. Um, we have an arch, but there's no desire here by the artist to make it look realistic. Um, so we have decorative, de decorative elements, we have illusionistic elements, we have figurative elements, all sort of combined to make this kind of hodgepodge fourth style. The last few images I want to look at are portraits. Um, Roman portraits are common to um, the fourth style. This comes from Pompeii, and I, I, I find this painting, I've always found this painting quite haunting, knowing that this couple probably perished um, when Vesuvius erupted. Uh, in this image, we see a young couple, uh, sort of the yuppies of their day, these young professionals who are trying to show off their wealth and their education. So that, first of all, that Roman verism that we see in the sculptures, we very much see here. Um, I feel like if we could go back in time and compare the actual people with their portraits, uh, they would be, these would be rather accurate. We see this man's, this young man's rather scraggly beard, his sort of large ears protruding from the side of his head, uh, this woman and her sort of uh, unplucked eyebrows. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting, uh, you know, this, this incredible realism here. Uh, if you look in her hand, she is holding a stylus, a um, writing device in her right hand. In her left hand, she has what is called a pugilare. Um, pu um, uh, pugilare comes from the Latin word for fist. Uh, in fact, we get the word pugilist from this. A uh, boxer is a person who fights with their fists, right? A pugilist is a boxer who fights with their fist. Um, but she's holding a wax tablet. Um, the Romans... Paper wasn't common at this time, especially, you know, in the way we think of it, where you can just kind of buy reams of paper. It was very, uh, it, was, it was fairly rare. So uh, when it came to education, um, students tended to write on these wax tablets. They were basically a um, sort of two little wooden tablets on a hinge, and on the inside would be wax. And then you could sort of scrape in whatever it was that you were writing into the wax. And then you could melt the wax or rub it with your hand and warm it up and start all over. Um, and in his hand is a... Um, is a scroll. So it's thought maybe that this is their marriage license, but there's also theories that he's, a, he's an attorney and this has something to do with his profession. We're not exactly sure. But what is important is these, that these two people are trying to show off their education. But there's a real sensitivity here by the artist in trying to capture the, the character and the facial features of these 
of this young couple, whose lives were probably ended much too soon uh, with the eruption of Vesuvius. On the image on the right, we have a very similar image, another woman with a tablet and a, a, a stylus. Um, this also comes from Pompeii. Um, I would say that the quality of this painting is, is slightly better than the other uh, painting of the couple that we saw um, in terms of sort of the three-dimensionality of the face, the use of shading in the hand here. Uh, we see this woman in a very similar pose, holding a stylus in this kind of show of thoughtfulness as in her hand here we see the pugilare um, once again we're we're meant to be seeing uh, thinking of this woman as an educated woman as a uh, as a thoughtful woman as a, as a woman who is capable uh, of some sort of level of intellect as would be befitting of her position as you know a, a sort of young but um, wealthy if not you know upwardly mobile type uh, in, in Pompeii. On the left, we have actually a, a rather rare image of a celebrity, a Greek poet named um, Meander. Menander here is shown in a typical, what we call an artist portrait, um, sitting down in a chair um, with his writing in his hand. This is very, very common in, um, in Roman art. It, it, it's not often seen in a wall painting like this. Instead, we would see it at the beginning of a scroll or later on of a book uh, of those artist collected works. But this image, actually, this style of artist portrait is something that we're going to be seeing continue through the Middle Ages, because after the Christianization of Rome, we're going to see um, the apostles, the gospel writers, um, saints, um, prophets from the Old Testament um, in this position uh, with uh, the, whatever book it was that they wrote from the Bible or um, whatever it happened to be in in their hand uh showing them sort of at work and so this this is important because um this kind of portrait will continue for thousands of years and the last image we have here is i think a rather fascinating image uh, from herculaneum uh, it's an image of some fruit but here we see that sort of Roman verism and that need to capture reality um, on a physical object uh, in much the same way in second style paintings we see that sort of illusionism. We see an artist trying to capture um, light passing through a, a glass vase. Um, to my knowledge this is something that that hasn't really been created or attempted in the ancient world up until this point. Um, and while the effect is not fully effective, while it's not um, the artist didn't get it quite right, the attempt is absolutely noteworthy um, because nothing like this had really been attempted before. And so that brings us to the end of our discussion of the uh, Roman uh, Republican period and early Roman sculpture, architecture, and painting. And so uh, for our next chapter, we'll be moving into the time of the Roman Empire.